All right. Uh, welcome to the second day of the 12th International Forum on Illegal, Unreported and Unregulated Fishing. Uh, my name is Anna Oberg, and I work in the Energy, Environment and Resource Department of Chatham House. And it's great to see that so many people are logging on. At the moment, we're climbing up towards 160. And uh, yesterday we had over 380, and I expect that we'll be reaching that number on this webinar as well. So the focus of today is on gender and IU fishing. Uh, but before we dig into the discussions, I'd just like to highlight some of the key takeaways from the first day of the forum. So we started out with the keynote speech by Ambassador Peter Thompson, who is the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean. And Ambassador Thompson emphasized that enhancing transparency, promoting cooperation and improving compliance with international agreements are key steps in the, in the fight against IU fishing. And he also commented on the progress made in implementing Sustainable Development Goal 14, especially the targets that relate to IU fishing, which are 14.6 and 14.4. And in this context, he especially stressed that it is possible to achieve SDG 14.6 on fishery subsidies before the end of the year. And he called on uh, new disciplines on fishery subsidies to be adopted at the meeting of the WTO General Council in December 2020. The actual panel discussion focused on the role of international cooperation in addressing IU fishing, and we had a great set of speakers lined up. We had uh, Matthew Camilleri from the UNFAO. We had Bronwyn Golder from Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions, and uh, Roberto Cesari from the European Commission, and Emily Langley from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and we also had Peter Horn as chair of the sessions. And I won't give you a full account of uh, what was discussed, but some of the key takeaways were that we have a pretty good international framework for addressing IU fishing. Uh, but the key thing to focus on now is really to make sure that these agreements are implemented. And the speakers noted that capacity building, especially in developing countries, is really important uh, to promote implementation. And many speakers, uh, I think all of them actually, emphasize that political will is absolutely critical. Uh, and that ex information exchange and transparency also play, play a crucial role. The speakers also highlighted uh, that it's not just cooperation at the global level that counts, but that co cooperation at the regional and sub-regional levels are important as well. Uh, and also cooperation between different actors. Uh, the seafood industry plays a key role in um, tackling IAU fishing. It was also noted that it's important to improve the cooperation between intergovernmental organizations and that these should um, strive to implement programs together. Um, some important organizations in this regard are the FAO, the IMO, the ILO, and UNODC. And as I mentioned, uh, we had over 380 people participating. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a fantastic discussion, uh, lots of really good questions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to answer all of them, but I think Peter did an excellent job of chairing. And I'm sure that today's discussion will be equally interesting. Um, before I leave the floor to Heiden Schutenberg, who is uh, today's chair, uh, I'd just like to run you through a, uh, a few logistical things. So I'm sure you're all Zoom experts uh, at this point in time, uh, but just as a reminder, uh, you are very, very welcome to ask questions. We want to make this forum as interactive as we possibly can. Uh, you can ask those by submitting them in the Q&A function uh, or by raising your hand. Um, and the raise your hand function allows you to pose a question verbally. We would, however, appreciate if you could write in the Q&A box uh, what your question will be and then just indicate that you'd like to raise uh, the question verbally so that we know what you're going to ask, because we will have a lot of questions, uh, we suspect. I would also like to say that uh, in addition to hosting this uh, webinar and to having attendees join on Zoom, we are uh, live streaming this session on the Chatham House website as well. So as I said, uh, today we'll focus on gender and IU fishing. Uh, I'd also like to really encourage you to join the rest of the week because we do have uh, a few great sessions lined up then as well. Tomorrow, we will be focusing on the role of uh, subsidies uh, and kind of how they contribute to IU fishing. And we will be discussing especially the important negotiations taking place within the WTO. On Thursday, uh, we will take regional focus. We will be looking at IU fishing in Southeast Asia. Uh, and on Friday, 
we have two sessions actually, one on transparency in IU fishing and one on new technologies. And I also forgot to say very importantly that we have two excellent keynote speakers lined up. On Thursday, we'll be hearing from Ayanur Biyana, who is an investigative reporter and who has written a really interesting book called The Outlaw Ocean. And on Friday, we will be hearing from Dr. Tup Manu Tupuruzan, who is the Director General of the Pacific Islands Forum uh, Fisheries Agency. But now I think it's uh, the time that we got started with the session today. So thanks again very much for attending. We are absolutely thrilled to see that 200 people are online already. Um, and yes, enjoy the discussions. Over to you, Heidi. Thank you, Anna. It's my great pleasure to chair this important session. And I wanna begin by welcoming all of you and inviting you to arrive in our webinar by taking a deep breath and taking a moment to think about fishing. When you picture fishing, what is it that you visualize? What's going on? Who's there? What about when you think about IUU fishing? Who does that bring to mind? And while I don't have an easy way to poll you, I can say from past experience that if your visualizations mainly involved men, you would be in pretty good company. But our hope is that by the end of this session, when you think about fishing and when you think about IUU fishing, you're also thinking about women. So during this session, we're going to unpack gender in fisheries. And I particularly want to unpack the role of women in three ways. First, how women are involved in every aspect of fishing, from harvesting to processing, trade and finance. Second, how this extensive involvement means that women have a direct stake in the way that fish stocks and seafood supply chains are managed and yet their voice is significantly underrepresented in decision-making. And third, how fisheries management, including efforts to counter IUU is stronger when women have a meaningful voice at the table. So we have an exceptional panel to support us in this discussion. I want to introduce them briefly now and I'll tell you about each of them more right before they speak. Dr. Sarah Harper with the University of British Columbia will share her research on the extent of women's involvement in fisheries. Esther Swaffield Bray is with the International Justice Mission and she's going to focus on some of the hidden gender issues drawing from IJM's work tackling cross-border trafficking into slavery on Thai fishing vessels. Then Professor Vasco Becker-Weinberg with the Univers Universidad Nova de Lisboa We'll review the current legal frameworks relevant to these issues and identify areas where reform is needed. And our anchor, to use a good marine pun, Edie Trudith Luganga, is the Secretary General of the African Network of Women Fish Processors and Traders. And she's going to share her experiences organizing women to improve both their livelihoods and fisheries management. So as your chair, I'm convinced that the quality of our session will come down to our engagement with you, the participants who've joined us. So let me say a little bit more about how you can join the conversation. I'm gonna frame our discussion briefly and then we'll hear from each panelist. Uh, we should have time for one, possibly two questions after each speaker. So do type your questions into the Q&A box as the panelists are presenting and you do have that option of liking great questions that others have offered. Then after the panel, we'll have 15 to 20 minutes to explore your ideas and questions on this topic. And I'm aware we have tremendous expertise joining us. So I am open to um, hearing your ideas as well as questions, but I am going to ask you to keep your ideas to 90 seconds or less if we do unmute you to share your thoughts. And as we reach the end, I'll invite each panelist to provide one minute of closing remarks. And I'm sure we will have surfaced some great insights during the session. So as we begin, let's take a moment to focus on the relationship between IUU fishing and gender and fisheries and two points in particular. 
First, how does IUU affect women in fisheries? And second, how can women affect fisheries management and help counter IUU fishing? And the first point I want to make is that when fish are unavailable or not easily available due to IUU fishing or other aspects of poor fisheries management, it can create a great deal of hardship for women. And I wanna focus on the developing world here for a few examples. First, when fish are unavailable, it affects women's small scale fishery businesses. And with that, their ability to pay for school fees and medical expenses, family expenses that we know are often paid disproportionately by women. Unstable fish supplies also affect women who work in industrial or semi-industrial fish processing. These women often have less secure jobs and lower paying jobs than male counterparts, and they're often the first to lose their jobs when declining catches reduce production. It's also well documented that in some areas, when fish are in short supply, it creates competition among fish buyers that can coerce women into trading sex for fish. And there are other ways that overfishing can lead to gender-based violence or issues with sexual health. My colleagues at IUCN have recently documented the relationships between gender-based violence and fisheries in a comprehensive review. And I've linked that report um, in the Google doc that's been shared with all of you and would encourage you to add your references and resources there as well. So women involved in fisheries have a direct stake in the quality of fisheries management and experience suggests that, they, that fisheries management is stronger when women also have a meaningful voice at the table. For example, in Cambodia, when uh, fishing community fishing management groups were required to include women, illegal fishing was reduced and fisheries management was improved because women brought stronger mechanisms for conflict resolution and advocated for greater transparency in management actions. In the Gambia, when women were given exclusive rights to manage mangroves and oyster fisheries within a national park, they implemented a closed season and habitat restoration that both improved livelihoods and replanted over 30 hectares of mangroves that are important habitats for the fisheries targeted by men. And finally, I'm aware of several interesting programs around the world that are working to address the second U in IUU, the unreported fishing, by working with women first buyers to improve catch documentation as an entry point for strengthening women's businesses and engaging them in fisheries management. So these and many other examples are included in a guide that USAID and IUCN released last year. And I've also provided a link to that in the Google Doc. So as we turn now towards our speakers, I want to invite you to really consider three issues in particular as we work together over the next hour and 15 minutes. First, how does IUU fishing affect men and women differently? Second, what actions can we take to empower both women and men to combat IUU fishing and improve fisheries management? And third, what would a gender sensitive approach to countering IUU look like? So I'm excited to start us off with Sarah's presentation. Sarah Harper is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia's Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries, where her work focuses on fisheries economics, policy, and social justice. Sarah applies feminist perspectives and economic theory to highlight the contributions of women to fisheries worldwide, including the role of indigenous women in fisheries leadership and governance. When she's not publishing widely in a range of journals, Sarah enjoys doing art projects with her kids and she reports they are so creative and messy, double exclamation mark. So Sarah, with that, let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Heidi. And it, let me just say it's such a privilege to share the virtual podium with so many great people. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you guys because I have a little presentation here. Oh, hold on.
There we go. Everyone can see that. Okay, so I'm going to kick things off with a very brief overview of the contributions by women to fisheries. And I'm going to preface this with the fact that when we're talking about gender and fisheries, we're not just talking about women. Um, we're not pitting men against women. Um, but because women have been largely omitted from the conversation, um, often overlooked and undervalued in fisheries, uh, and very much considered secondary actors in fisheries economies, uh, I'm going to focus on women and their contributions, uh, and then give you some specific recommendations around IEU fishing. So let's start here. So I want, um, much like Heidi did, in getting to you to sort of imagine what you think of when you think of fisheries, um, a picture like this might come to mind. So boats on the water filled with men. Um, but this picture doesn't represent the diversity of roles and activities that make up fisheries economies worldwide. Um, there's really an incredible diversity across contexts and even within the same context, but um, this is often the view that we uh, or the frame that informs management decisions. And this is problematic. Um, so when we expand this view and consider sort of the panoramic shot, um, stitching together kind of what happens on shore, what happens in homes, um, we really see a much broader and diverse set of activities and spaces uh, where fisheries and fishing activities take place. Um, and then when we extend that to thinking of the impact of IU fishing, um, we have to consider all these various facets. So um, contrary to the previous picture, um, around the world, women do fish, um, but often in different ways and in different habitats than men. Um, but these aren't always considered fishing uh, and not always considered in fisheries management plans. Uh, but women have long been and continue to be direct producers of seafood, and although their fishing activities and catches um, often go unreported or underreported, um, they make very important contributions to um, household food and livelihood security. Um, so this is a picture um, of a woman or some women free divers off the Korean island of uh, Jeju. And for many, many generations, women have been harvesting shellfish. Um, but of course, um, in many contexts around the world, uh, declining fish stocks, uh, climate change, and other factors have an impact on all of these fishing activities. So myself and uh, some colleagues and many contributions from um, people working on women and fisheries around the world tried to estimate just how much um, these un underreported or unreported catches by women amounted to. Um, and we estimated that approximately 2 million women worldwide catch about 3 million tons of seafood valued at over uh, $5.6 billion. Um, and these contributions um, are not always considered um, when, we, when we think about fisheries. These catches are often uh, for home consumption or sale at local markets. Um, and they're not necessarily from those industrial fisheries where a lot of IU fishing takes place and where the majority of capacity enhancing subsidies go. Women also play key roles in the onshore activities that convert fish to marketable consumable products. Uh, women dominate a lot of the post-harvest sector activities um, such as processing and sale of fish, as Heidi mentioned. Um, this picture is from Liberia, um, where um, it, it is the case, and in much of West Africa, women might not be out on boats, but they're everywhere else as gear and equipment owners, processors, marketers, uh, financiers, uh, but are often subject to poor working conditions, gender-based violence, and unequal pay. So IU fishing and the ways that we combat them um, affect all of these people, um, influencing the supply of fish um, to be processed and sold, um, and potentially exacerbating um, already existing issues and uh, gender inequalities. So the invisibility of women in fisheries, along with things like gender or social norms and expectations limiting their participation, have led to women very much being underrepresented in fisheries decision-making. 
Um, so a lot of fisheries management is continues to be dominated by men. Uh, seafood industry boards of directors and CEOs um, also very much dominated by men. Uh, and in many contexts, uh, fishing cooperatives um, exclude membership by women and where women are involved, they're not necessarily uh, given a voice or what they're saying is not necessarily incorporated into um, those decisions. Um, but management decisions, um, as you can imagine, really directly influence their ability to access and benefit from fisheries. So as managers of households, community organizers, teachers, uh, knowledge holders, in, in the case of a lot of the indigenous fishing communities that I've interacted with, uh, women play a very critical role in in resilience, uh, the resilience of fishing communities around the world. Um, and these roles often are unpaid and go unnoticed, but are as agents of change um, in their communities, women are key to the health of the oceans and all those that depend on them. So this is a picture of women from a coastal indigenous community on the west coast of Canada that I had the privilege of working and observing um, these women who are really leading efforts to protect an important herring fishery um, that is of cultural and economic importance to their community and their identity as indigenous people. And so in a lot of cases, women are very much involved in um, the advocacy and the protection of these resources, but are not necessarily given the recognition or the voice that, um, that they, they should. Um, so now looping this all back to um, combating IEU fisheries, um, how can we simultaneously promote gender equality? So from my work on gender and fisheries, I think it's absolutely crucial uh, that we address the lack of fisheries data disaggregated by sex, which is necessary to perform gender analysis, um, and to identify a lot of those inequalities and highlight um, overlooked actors and activities. We absolutely need more women at the decision-making table, um, and we really need to work uh, together to tackle SDG 14 alongside SDG 5. And so things like um, target 14.6, the elimination of harmful subsidies, um, these ecologically harmful subsidies um, could be redirected towards um, things that promote better working conditions um, for women and men um, and promote more quality products as opposed to uh, further exploiting already depleted stocks. Um, so those are some things that I think about when I think about um, how we kind of simultaneously combat IEU fisheries and promote gender equality. So I see that I'm over time here. So I'm just gonna end here. Um, by saying that um, the challenges facing our ocean are increasingly complex and we need the voices of women uh, alongside men and elders, children to find solutions to these pressing issues. So I'm gonna hand it back to Heidi and see if there's any questions or time for questions. So thank you very much and I'll hand it over. Thank you, Sarah. And bye. By my clock, that was perfect timing. So let me let me commend you. And as the questions are coming in, I'll go ahead and ask the first one. Um, in your research, where you are seeing women taking leadership roles, and you mentioned some interesting examples, what factors are supporting women and being able to have that voice? What are the conditions where you see women being able to um, have a voice at the table and to be leaders in this work? Yeah, I think so. I mean, drawing on the examples that um, I have more in depth knowledge of, I think really very much having the, the support of other people in the community, especially men. And um, so, you know, I immediately think of this example, uh, which this picture, this last picture is from um, on the central coast of, of, of British Columbia, um, of Canada. And these women um, live in a community where there, there is sort of a tradition, a pre-colonial <laughs> tradition of, of very powerful women being decision makers. And a lot of that was sort of displaced during kind of the colonial period. And women are sort of refine, or rediscovering that, that voice. And that's very much been part of kind of the process of reasserting their rights as Indigenous people. So I think there's 
you know, I think having the support of the community and having, you know, everyone kind of realize that, that a lot needs to shift for that to happen is where I see that being successful. Terrific. Thank you so much. All right. With that, we are going to turn to Esther. Esther is the Director of England for the International Justice Mission, or IJM. IJM is the world's largest anti-slavery organization working with local law enforcement to bolster their response to modern slavery, identifying and protecting survivors of exploitation and holding traffickers to account. And when I ask Esther what most excites her about this work, she shared with me that she's passionate about how by addressing these root causes, it's possible to prevent exploitation before it's even begun and that that excites her hugely, as I'm sure it would excite all of us. Thank you, Esther, over to you. Thank you so much, Tidy, and thank you, Sarah, for kicking us off. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen as well. Here we go. Well, um, hi everybody, and it's such a joy uh, to be joining you. Um, as Heidi said, my name's Esther and I'm part of the team leading IJM, International Justice Mission. And um, as Heidi mentioned, we work around the world alongside government authorities to protect those living in poverty uh, from violence. And uh, today I'm going to be drawing particularly upon IJM's work tackling uh, slavery onto Thai fishing boats. And we're going to draw out some of the, the hidden gender dynamics uh, that's part of this work. But first, I wanted to, to kick off and, and share with you a little bit about why this conversation about gender really matters. I remember vividly the time that I first met a survivor of slavery. It was uh, in a rural ca uh, Cambodian village um, where I sat in a circle on, on rickety plastic chairs with 10 or so others as a man told us his story and his name was Dom. You can see him here. He was a farmer who was struggling to provide for his family and so when a recruiter came to his village him and his wife agreed to take a chance. Their hope was to make a better life for their kids. Now, what they didn't know was that the first day of his new job would be the last day he would see his wife. And he was enslaved on that boat for nearly seven and a half years, trafficked onto Thai fishing fleets, which became his floating prison. Back home, his wife was left terrified. That same recruiter would come knocking at her door, reminding her of the debt her family owed. She was alone and she had so little to live on, so few means of caring for their children that eventually uh, their eldest child was taken for a job by the same recruiter. You see, Dom was not the only person deceived and exploited in this story. The whole family had been left vulnerable. And you see, for every statistic, there is a story. For every fisher man, there will be a family. And this is the hidden gender dynamic of this work. IJM first began working to tackle slavery in the Thai fishing industry in 2017. And to date, we as IJM have found that those enslaved on boats really are generally all men. However, there are strong trends beginning to emerge of the upstream effects in unregulated cases that have previously been fairly unnoticed. What might they be? Well, the process of enslavement in nearly all the cases we've been working on follow a remarkably similar pattern, whereby a broker or a loan shark will come to an impoverished village like, like Dom's uh, with an offer of a job in return for an upfront payment. And that means that it's not only the migrant workers who are plunged into debt, but importantly, it's also their families who are plunged into debt long before anybody has set foot on a boat. And there are some really key outcomes that IJM are seeing from this. 
first of all, it's the fear, the psychological effect. That process of recruitment, the debt bondage, not only enslaves the fishermen to their work, but it ties the family into fear. Why? Well, quite simply, that loan shark knows where they live. It begins in the home. And secondly, there's the loss of income that's felt. When the fisherman's work is not subject to any labour protections and he's not paid fairly, then that fisherman ceases to be able to provide for the family. In, in Dom's case, he was able to send home around $40 the entire time he was enslaved. That's $40 in seven years. His children had not only lost their dad, but they lost their actual means of survival, of, of paying their school fees, of access to education. The family left at home are, are now more vulnerable than ever before. And thirdly, that leads to this increased vulnerability. Because of the debt taken on by the whole family, the risk of exploitation for those at home has increased exponentially. And IGM have seen firsthand the devastating effects of this, that they become much more vulnerable to other forms of exploitation, such as labour trafficking into agricultural work or domestic servitude and, and even sexual exploitation. When the family are left vulnerable, these other forms of abuse become far more common. You see, these upstream effects are rarely discussed by government and non-governmental stakeholders alike, despite strong anecdotal evidence of exploitation in source communities that continues long after a man has been trafficked onto a boat. The wives and the daughters and the children left behind, these are the invisible victims of IUU fishing, which for too long have been ignored. A brief case study if I can share with you uh, a case from 2018 uh, where IJM supported the Thai authorities to rescue a family of 12 for whom this had been exactly the case. Working with a broker, the traffickers had first lured the men of the family from, from Myanmar across the border into Thailand, where they were enslaved on fishing boats. But following this, the broker returned and preyed upon two young girls from the family who were then forced into domestic servitude. Shortly afterwards, a third young woman from the same family was forced at knife point to marry one of the perpetrator's workers. The deputy director of special investigation reflected on this case, sharing it's not just men who are targeted. It's not just one migrant worker, but also their whole family. In the past few years, there have been such promising steps made forward from businesses in protecting their supply chains, and we celebrate that. But protecting these invisible women and girls will require a system change, not just individual and company-led action. And the good news is, that is very much possible. IJM's work over the last 20 years, transforming justice systems, has proved that it is possible to protect those living in poverty from violent exploitation. For example, the landmark project called Project Lantern, which documented the impact of working to reduce a sexual exploitation in the Philippines by strengthening justice systems, uh, was found by the Gates Foundation uh, to reduce uh, rates of exploitation of up to 86% in just four years, in just as daunting an environment. When a justice system is strengthened, when laws are enforced, when traffickers are held to account, it is possible to see the world's most vulnerable affected, protected rather, on boats and at home. So to conclude, I began sharing with you about Dom and some good news is we managed to reunite him with his wife and children. Here they are. And they are doing really well. We must remember that it is not just men who are trafficked and enslaved, but there is a network of women and girls who are left behind and who then become more vulnerable. They have been largely invisible to researchers and they are hidden victims of IUU fishing. 
success in this area will look like increased safety and protection for those on land as well as those on boats and in processing. And what will be required is investment at a systemic level to ensure they aren't left vulnerable in the first place. They might be upstream, but let's not forget them. Thank you. Back to you, Heidi. Thank you so much, Esther. Thank you for giving us uh, such a clear picture of victims who've often been hidden and really helping us to see the full impact of IUU fishing and the associated labor abuse on, on women. Um, that is the full time. So I'm going to go ahead and turn us to Vasco now. Uh, Professor Vasco Becker Weinberg lectures at the Faculty of Law at the Universidad Nova de Lisboa on the law of the sea and ocean governance subjects. He's researched at prominent academic institutions and written and published extensively on the law of the sea. Uh, he was the, previously the legal advisor to the Portuguese. He's Secretary of the Sea and a full-time scholar at the International Max Planck Research Institute for Marine Affairs at the University of Hamburg. So over to you, Vasco. Thank you, Heidi, uh, for that kind of introduction. And good afternoon to all. Um, my name is Vasco Becker Weinberg, as was mentioned. I'm a professor at the Nova School of Law, and I'll be talking to you about some of the complexities dealing with the legal framework that has to address some of the uh, aspects that has been, have already been mentioned by the previous two speakers. Um, and they are quite challenging, as uh, I hope to, to make you aware of. Um, I'll just dive into uh, the main uh, aspects. Um, first thing we have to understand is that not, not every person subject to forced labor is a victim of human trafficking, but every victim of human trafficking is subject to forced labor or some other form of violence, such as sexual abuse. In the case of gender, uh, the issue becomes extremely complex. As it was just uh, demonstrated by Sarah, the, 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 although the victim might not be uh, a woman or a girl, the impact on women or girls within a fishing community is quite significant. Um, the important thing to understand that this is not a phenomenon just located in one part of the world. Uh, we see this all over the world, the connection one way or the other in aquaculture or in uh, traditional fisheries but you do see it in most parts of the world. Um, not only are the conditions of fishing communities, as we also saw in some of the pictures shown earlier, very, very uh, difficult, very precarious. Those on board fishing vessels are amongst the most inhumane working places in the world. IUF, however, is an activity with high degree of impunity and reward, and that's why it is so, um, it continues to thrive particularly as fishing becomes more scarce and uh, fish stocks diminish. Uh, and it has a damaging effect on small scale fish communities and then a whole sorts of uh, aspects that come from this, including piracy and terrorism. On shore, the reality is very different. The fishing communities are subject to the jurisdiction of only one state. At sea, however, we find the possibility for more uh, for possible interference by other states to combat this phenomena, but it's easier said than done because the rules under international law are quite intricate. And therefore, it has been said that uh, uh, IUF in connection with human trafficking can be translated as being out of sight and out of reach. If we take this example, that fisher was for seven years away from his family and there was very little uh, chances of actually saving him. And this is one of the biggest problems we have in trying to um, mine the gaps of international law. As it was also mentioned, the overwhelming majority of victims are uh, men and also boys. Uh, women and girls are trafficked and forced to work in the processing chain of the unloaded catch and onshore operations. The abuse is tremendous and it raises several human rights issues. Uh, and it was also mentioned by Heidi in her introductory notes, fish for sex is a, is a reality in certain parts of the world, not all, but in very specific parts of the world. But the problem is that at national level, often these are, mis these are misrepresented, these women are misrepresented as sex workers or establishing with a link with prostitution. 
when in fact they are fully active economic agents, productive agents, and they actually uh, are the breadwinner of their own families. And therefore, uh, it, it, the, the representing or making an affair assessment of actually what actually is happening on the ground can be quite difficult. There is not a lack of international legal law applicable to protecting women and girls in these circumstances. And these are applicable to both the onshore or offshore. It is true, most victims are men, but we have seen women being trafficked also to work on fishing vessels, but these are a very small uh, percentage. Um, overall, there is a general-based discrimination faced by women both in traditional and commercial and industrial fishing and uh, in coastal communities uh, throughout the whole process uh, of uh, the unloaded fish. What are the shortcomings? Firstly, not many states have ratified essential legal instruments, and I will mention one spe specifically uh, in a few minutes. There is a lack of harmonization of national laws and international law. Just recently, I was involved in a project where we tried very much to achieve harmonization in Southeast Asia. This was under the ILO, and we did see the discrepancies. And as we can see, there are a lot of different states involved. Sarah mentioned the home state, the transit state, the destination state, and then we also have the flag state, the port state, and the coastal state. And therefore, harmonization and implement, effective implementation is extremely relevant. There is a shortage of law enforcement cooperation, uh, which then brings a whole lot of issues that we could discuss, but we don't have time for. And then there are many other aspects. I would highlight in, in this slide one key aspect, we do need urgent global consumer awareness and responsibility. And that is something I'll come back to in my uh, concluding remarks. As it was also mentioned, I will not take more than 10 seconds to highlight the importance of really addressing uh, Agenda 2030 uh, uh, in a holistic approach. Often we think about illegal fishing and we focus on Goal 14, but this is also about gender equality. It's also about decent work and economic growth, uh, women's rights to, to a decent work, and about peace and strong institutions on the ground. Uh, and I will also come to the importance of these the institutional arrangements on the ground. So what are the challenges at sea? Firstly, there are issues dealing with where does illegal fishing happen? And who and how do we uh, act against a, a flag state that does not want to comply with international law? And that raises many difficult issues. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't go into them. But the important thing is that it becomes more and more difficult as there are more vessels at sea transporting more people and more goods. It's not possible to control. Also, logistically, uh, uh, the, the fishing vessels where you do see forced labor and human trafficking, they don't call into shore quite often people are just, they stay on board of the vessel without coming into shore. And then the different vessels come in to, to take the, the load off the ship. And then it continues uh, for many, many years even. Unfortunately, international law only woke up to this problem later on seriously. Fishers are by far the least protected uh, persons at, uh, at sea, even compared to seafarers, for example. So the legal framework that would be essential to implement would be the 2014 protocol to the forced labor convention. And here it will be extremely important because this would be applicable also onshore and offshore. I, will, I can't go into many of the details of this protocol. Well, the important thing is that this should be complemented with the trafficking protocol. And this is extremely important because it's here where we see the enforcement gaps that we should tackle. For example, there has been an attempt to make human trafficking and forced labor at sea and, and a, a sort of uh, uh, application or interpretation of slavery at sea, which it cannot be done conceptually, but it, it highlights the shortcomings of international law. Um, another important aspect that I will only highlight here, in addition to con developing consumer responsibility and awareness, is also to follow the money where these uh, uh, states actually keep their assets where or states that allow uh, assets coming from illegal fishery to be um, to be uh, accommodated in their own jurisdiction and therefore having a more global approach to this phenomenon the ILO working in fishing convention is extremely important unfortunately it has not been absolutely ratified but it has to be it's it's growing the number of ratification and it must be implemented throughout um, 
some of the aspects that have been already, that are mentioned actually are essentially based on the importance of states really undertaking their responsibility to protect. Sovereignty comes with the responsibility to prevent and to react. It should not be an opportunity to create a permissible environment for the human trafficking and the fishing to take place, particularly uh, uh, on, on the backs of gender discrimination. I would point out that some of the elements that I did mention were not able, I couldn't cover in these seven minutes that I was allotted to. Uh, mo most of this is in a very good book, Gender and the Law. They see that it came out last year and I wrote a chapter precisely on these aspects. I would invite you to uh, do your own research. And if you have any questions, just feel free to get in touch with me. And of course, I look forward to your questions. I hope I did keep the time. Thank you, Heidi. Perfect timing, Vasco. Thank you for um, that wonderful and comprehensive overview. Um, that is the, the 10 minutes. So I'll turn to Edie Trudith in a moment, um, but I am I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions here as we move into um, the larger discussion, Vasco. Also, just to uh, cue us up for after Edie Trudith's presentation, I wanted to see if a few people who submitted questions would be willing to be unmuted and to make those comments um, verbally. So if uh, the following folks are in a position where they can be unmuted after Edie Trudith and share their insights, could you please um, raise your hand in the participant box? And that is Arlene Satapornovit and Faluke Areola. If, if you two would be willing to speak after Edie Trudith's presentation, please raise your hand in the participants box. And if not, I will summarize your comments from the question and answer. And for anyone else, as you are putting your great questions in the Q&A box, if you are prepared to speak to them directly, please note that behind your question or comment. All right, with that, I would like to introduce Edie Trudith. Uh, she is the founder and executive director of the Environmental Management and Economic Development Organization which is a not-for-profit organization that seeks to address environmental, social, and economic challenges in Tanzania. She's also the Secretary General of the African Women Fish Processors and Traders Network um, and a convener of the Tanzania Women Fish As Workers Association. Both of these support women fish workers in Africa to get organized, participate, advocate, and influence policy and decision-making processes. And I also wanted to flag that she's co-president of the World Forum of Fish Harvesters and Fish Workers, which represent both male and female fishers uh, to uphold human rights and social justice. That's a group that brings together 42 national organizations of small scale fishers. And when I ask Edie Trudith what most excites her about this work, she told me that it's listening to the untold stories from women fish processors and traders that it's just so amazing to see that despite the challenges, they're still pushing, they don't quit, and that they're moving stories of perseverance and ingenuity in the face of enormous odds spur her on every day to fight for their rights. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Edie Trudith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi, for this uh, very beautiful introduction. And I would like to start by thanking Anna and the Chatham House for inviting me to speak in this session, to share my ex uh, experiences in empowering and organizing women in the fisheries sector in Africa. And this is very interesting. I'm really honored for this opportunity. Um, my work that I'll be sharing this evening is um, through the African Network of Women Fish Processors and Traders that was established about three years ago. And uh, to begin with, I would like to um, start by briefly sharing with you how did this come to being. Uh, next slide, Anna. So as, as we have heard from the previous speakers, um, there are several gender inequalities existing in the sector that leave women marginalized and hinder their access to natural resources, knowledge, skills, and capital required for their fish businesses. 
So about uh, four years ago in 2016, the African Union Inter-African Bureau for Animal Resources organized a training um, on um, fish handling and hygiene that draw, uh, brought together women from all over the continent. And through these three days interaction among these women, they came to realize that despite making up more than 27% of the workforce in the African fisheries and aquaculture, and despite making a significant contribution in food security and livelihoods and household income and being the great majority in the sector because they, they represent about more than 90%. So they realized that despite all this, they still suffer a lot and they face similar challenges across the continent. So I wouldn't want to repeat what um, my, uh, my fellow previous speakers have already said. And so after the three days of this um, training, they came up with a very strong recommendation to um, AU IBA to support them keep in touch. And they went ahead and proposing that uh, wanted to form a continental platform for women fish processors and traders that would allow them to unify their, their, their voices and to try to engage in development processes in the sector. So as a response to that, in 2017, uh, the AU IBA supported these women to come together through a regional consultative workshop that led to the formation of uh, the Continental Platform, which is the very first Continental Platform uh, to promote equity and strengthen the contribution of women to the to sustainable uh, fisheries sector. Next slide, please. So what are the objectives of um, OfficeNet? Why, why was it formed? So the objectives of OfficeNet are inspired by the policy framework and reform strategy um, for fisheries and, and aquaculture in, in Africa that seeks to creating a conducive and enabling environment for fish sector to create uh, for, for, for fisheries and aquaculture sector in Africa. So this strategy has some policy actions and considerations on small scale fisheries and at the same time on gender that seeks to see that fishers are organized to foster good uh, fisheries governance, but also sustainable development and responsible use of natural resources. But also it looks at capacity, uh, it seeks at building the capacity of fisheries stakeholders and institutions for participatory management of fisheries uh, to see that they are developed and nurtured. And at the same time, to recognize the critical role played by women and put in place mechanisms to promote and protect women's rights to participate in all aspects of fisheries and aquaculture. And at the end of the day also to improve the access of women to fish and fish markets, particularly through the provision of credit and affordable rates. So I just looked at what they want to, uh, to, to realize or to achieve um, in the perspective of small scale fisheries and gender. So our fishnet seeks to facilitate collaboration and cooperation between and among women fish processors and traders. And they want also uh, to, to facilitate processes that will provide this um, forum through which women can collectively share experiences and advocate for one voice for the sector reforms and development actions that empower women to leverage their capacity to access and sustainably manage and utilize um, the, the, the fisheries resources um, sustainably. So in order to do that, uh, the strategy that is being employed, the next slide please, uh, include uh, raising awareness on the need to improve the living and working conditions of women in the sector, but also advocate, which is very important for the women to, to, to engage, to advocate on the key role played by the African women, um, fish processors and traders, 
particularly in the, uh, in the post service sector, but also engaging in creating change that will guide and structure the empowerment of the fish post harvest activities um, in Africa. So our, uh, our fish net, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, our fish net envisages uh, seeing um, and engaging the national associations of women fish processors and traders because the membership to the network are national organizations of women uh, fish workers in different countries. And currently, we have uh, members from 28 countries, and we are aspiring to uh, facilitate establishment of national organizations of women fish processors and traders in all the 155 countries members of African Union. So our fish net is never going to be strong if the national organizations are not strong. So this is what we have been working hard to support women in the uh, to, to, to get organized or to strengthen their capacity in areas where they already exist. So in the three years of our fish net existence, next slide please, what is it that uh, we have been able to do? In order to engage and stay united as a continental platform, our main preoccupation has been to facilitate collaboration and cooperation between women fish processors and traders associations within and across the countries in Africa. We have been able to establish uh, communication um, methodologies, communication tools. We have a WhatsApp group for all the women members from 28 countries for, at the moment. We have Facebook page, we have Twitter, we have website. But what is key for us is to continue our strategic engagement in strengthening the national uh, and building the capacities of the national associations members that in, in the countries where they already exist. And where they don't exist, we are also making efforts to facilitate processes where they also have, uh, they'll be organized and to be able to, co to, co to collaborate. So you will see, uh, please go into the other slides. I'll just show pictures where uh, it indicates the activities that we have been able to, to, to do. Uh, we have conducted national consultative workshops. For example, this was in Ghana. Next slide, please. We've also done the same for um, Madagascar and then um, in Tanzania as well, leadership trainings. We've conducted bureau meetings because our fishnet has a bureau uh, meeting which is represented by 10 members. We have also been able, next slide, please, please keep uh, going because it's, these are just pictures that are illustrating what we have been able to, to, to do within these three years. And just last year in April, we have conducted our very first general assembly that again, is, is, um, it allowed members to share experiences to uh, um, support each other. And um, what we have been able to, next slide, please. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, yeah, just showing the pictures. And then what we have been, uh, we can learn through these processes. Next slide, please. Is that, yes, thank you. So what we can learn through this uh, case study of African uh, continental platform of women, fish processors and traders is that um, it shows us or it illustrates the significant role women play and the power of collective action, which is a significant mechanism that has a huge potential to help countries, regional and international bodies, communities and other actors to overcome the challenges such as the IOU fishing that we are discussing today. So bringing, coming, uh, building the capacities of women is very important. Uh, supporting women to organize, to collaborate is also key. So the message that I want to send across here is that strengthening institutional and organizational capacity of women's networks is one of the concrete solutions to facilitate capacity development in terms of organizational skills, but also in terms of better handling, um, such as processing and marketing, but also peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and, and, and hence improving fisheries governance outcomes. And um, also through our fishnet, um, 
it shows us that um, enhanced engagement of women in policy and decision making processes at national and regional levels is important because now we are seeing some steps being done uh, in engaging women and therefore reducing the gender gap across the fisheries value chain. And to, fish it, to finish it off now, I would like, um, please move to the next slide. Um, it is important to, to note that women uh, key players and their engagement in combating IUU is critical. However, um, this calls for the recognition uh, of women as key actors in the fisheries sector, but also empowering them through organizing and skills building, building, creating space for them in the management and enforcement efforts and improving equitable and safe working conditions in the processing, but also strengthening the regulatory and policy frameworks, provide better engagement opportunities and protection. So this is very important that um, in order for all these efforts to happen and improving the fisheries governance, women are critical, they are very key. And as much as we are fighting the IUU, it is important also to, uh, to make efforts to fighting the IIU which means that um, we should stop ignoring contribution of women. We should appreciate and recognize their work. Thank you very much. And in case there is any question, and um, uh, you will need to learn more of what our fishnet is doing, I'm ready to share on bilateral means, but also through the questions that will be raised. Thank you very much. Back to you, Heidi. Thank you, Edie Trudith, and thank you for demonstrating those many ways that we can empower women through your work every day. So we now have about 15 minutes to work together as a community to unpack these issues. And here's what I'm thinking. We have some numbers, people, in the question box. So I'm going to start by uh, echoing some of the questions that we have about prevalence of some of these issues. Maybe first going to Sarah uh, to answer a question on, can you you say more in terms of quantifying women's involvement in different aspects of fisheries? And then there have been questions that maybe Esther or Vasco can take a stab at in terms of the prevalence of some of the labor abuse or the scale of the labor abuse you've been talking to. Um, after that, we will unmute Blaise uh, uh, Kumlangan uh, to ask your very highly rated question here, our number one question on the definition of IUU and should it more explicitly address some of the labor abuse, the illegal labor, labor practices we've been hearing about? And then after that, we will unmute um, Fluke to make the observation on the importance of women's economic empowerment to their ability to advocate for stronger fisheries management. So let's start. Sarah, are you able to... Um, offer a bit more insight with some, some numbers around women's role in fisheries? Uh, I think, um, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a question I put a lot of thought into <laughs> for my PhD work and continue to through um, some involvement in various projects, which is really trying to kind of um, bring forward some of these, these hidden or missing dimensions when we, when we talk about contributions to especially small scale fisheries where women are much more um, involved. But I think one of the big challenges is there's not very, the, the data sets that capture employment in fisheries just are not very comprehensive, both in terms of the, the, the types of activities they cover. So there's definitely a focus on fisheries production and not necessarily on all the other aspects of the fish value chain. Um, and the types of data that are collected in different kinds of, um, by different kinds of agencies, so uh, are often grouped. And so you often get fisheries data grouped with um, forestry and agriculture. So it's very hard to tease those apart. And um, where they are disaggregated by sex, often they're, they're very much missing a lot of those informal and uh, part-time activities. There's a lot of work by women that is done seasonally, and that's not necessarily captured when you do a frame survey of fishers um, in a given month of the year. So I think there's a lot of reasons, both institutionally, capacity-wise, but also just in terms of 
the bias um, around data collection and, and thinking through um, what is considered you know, fisheries economies. And so uh, there are efforts that are trying to kind of build those numbers more robustly, but I think we're a long way off in terms of having like a very accurate number. So um, I think you know, there, there's a lot of evidence that suggests at least half of those involved in, in, in the full length of the fish value chain are women. Um, but in terms of specific activities, I think it varies a lot depending on the context or the subsector you're talking about. So hopefully that gives you a little bit to think about. I was definitely hoping we would have a call for gender disaggregated data during our, our session. So I'm glad we got that in. And FAO will often, um, I think the number is that about half the seafood supply chain taken as a whole is probably made up of women. Would you agree with that as a rule of thumb? I think if you were looking sort of broadly, that probably captures it. But again, I think there is a lot of variation within you know, a, a particular context within a country, uh, within the, the, the node of the fish value chain. So, um, and I think, you know, I'm not necessarily comfortable saying that for sure, this is the number, um, but I think, uh, you know, I think there's a lot more than, than, we, than we think um, in terms of women's involvement. And I think that's just because we've had our blinders on to only looking at sp specific activities. And, you know, I think even people who, who you know, think of the, that whole broad picture um, might not necessarily be capturing all those activities. So some efforts by uh, the FAO and World Fish and uh, Duke University and a project called Eliminating Hidden Harvests is trying to tackle um, that very question around, um, you know, how do we how do we capture some of these hidden components of small scale fisheries in terms of the social, economic, and various different facets? And one of that. One of the pieces to that is around sex disaggregated or gender dis disaggregated data and, and trying to improve that. But very much there's, what we're seeing is there's a lot of gaps. So, yeah. Super. All right, well, it's great to hear about the work starting to fill those, those gaps. Um, Esther, can I turn to you for um, any insights from IJM on the prevalence of some of the issues you were describing? Yeah, I mean, to echo Sarah's point, there's um, still a big, uh, gap in terms of gender data that we're um, that we need to collect, but um, in terms of the prevalence of trafficking, particularly when we're looking in this project in in Thai fishing fleets, um, our kind of prevalence study in 2016, published in 2017 in partnership with the Sara Institute, um, came back with some just shocking results, just some headline figures that. Um, around 81% uh, of those that were surveyed in the Thai fishing um, industry included um, the purpose element of trafficking. Um, around 75% uh, of people surveyed reported working at least 16 plus hours at sea. Um, the thing that really struck me that it was around 6% of workers uh, reported having seen a crewmate murdered at sea. Um, and close to 90% received uh, less than minimum wage. Um, that was across hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workers surveyed, um, particularly in that area of the Thai fishing fleet. So we know that, that trafficking uh, is, is rampant, um, and particularly like in the, share, the story that I shared around where transshipments taking place, these abuses are happening deep in, in, in the ocean. Um, these are people that are, are being sent out and that actually are hard to reach. So um, it's good to be having this conversation um, and, and, and keeping aware of those very, very hard to reach cases. Um, Vasco, you might be able to speak a little bit more into that as well. And I might ask, I might ask Vasco to answer our next question, um, just so we can get in as many as possible. I'm watching the time. It seems we're on warp speed with time here. I don't know how that's happening. So if we can unmute Blaze, um, and then I'd like Vasco to maybe take the first stab at answering Blaze's question. Blaze, uh, you are okay. unmuted. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you to uh, Chatham House for organizing this uh, very useful forum. Um, uh, my question is in, in, is in relation to the fact that the term IOU fishing is, has a very specific meaning 
The term is defined under paragraph three of the International Plan of Action on the Prevention, de uh, Deterrence, and, um, and, and uh, what is it again? Prevent, deter, and eliminate illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. So um, I've, I've been struggling to see the connection between the gender issues, the trafficking and slavery issues, and are you fishing? The only connection is that it, these other crimes are happening within the um, within the uh, the sphere of, of uh, the fishing activity itself. Now, I'm not discounting them as, as as not being important. What I'm saying is that they need to be addressed. Uh, the problem here is that perhaps the term are you fishing is um, is quite narrow, and it has a set of uh, propose uh, options in terms of responses to address IUU fishing that are laid out in the IPOA IUU. So the question is, um, I think should be whether the term IUU fishing should be broadened so that it covers these other crimes as well, or whether we should uh, acknowledge that this perhaps is a separate uh, 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 connected but separate group of, of, of crimes that need to be dealt with with a set of specific actions. Of course, uh, hand in hand with the actions that are carried out with um, carried out in relation to IUU fishing. Terrific, thank you. So Vasco, could you give us some preliminary thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, Lays, for that question. I don't think we should uh, uh, reconceptualize IUF because we have IUF in circumstances where you do not have human trafficking or slavery or forced labor, uh, but it's still it's IUF. Uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, criminal minds are intricate and uh, crime is very sophisticated and the connections are there. What brings together uh, human trafficking and for, uh, IUF is that both illegal activities are extremely profitable. And that's the biggest, uh, um, uh, um, what attracts the, the connection between the two. Uh, in, together with a lot of migrant uh, movement uh, within uh, certain regions, such as Southeast Asia, for example, that makes it difficult. So we have to look at them uh, in their own uh, uh, the circumstances, but we have to work together being aware of the challenges that are there. That's why I mentioned we have to bring together source transit destination countries as flag, coastal and port states. And if, if you implement, for example, the ILO Convention on, work, uh, on Working Fishing, this allows, for example, port states to have a very strong role in combating the presence of human trafficking, forced labor in uh, illegal fishing. So th that was key. Heidi, I would just very skim through the, some of the questions that were put up there, and I'll be very brief. One that was put forward by Mario Al-Qaeda, uh, if I had to mention three uh, aspects that should be implemented uh, and make a huge difference uh, now, would be implementation of international uh, legal instruments into national law. Uh, there are still many states being you don't have the idea of complicity in international law, but many states allow the permissive environment for these things to happen. So implementation is key and holding those states accountable. Second, stakeholder involvement. I, in the project that I was in, I had to talk and reach out to government and public administration, ship owners and fisher organizations. There are three different perspectives between denial and panic, you see everything. Uh, the important thing is that you need to formalize the fisher relationship with its, his or, or her employer. Uh, and this is really one of the key aspects. I can't go into much detail, but I'll be happy to exchange bilaterally if you want. The other third element is information sharing. Um, information sharing, not only within the same state, but between states in the region and between international or, uh, uh, entities such as Interpol, for example, that will be key. On the issues dealing with national data, uh, uh, we do see human trafficking and forced labor in agriculture, for example, in different states, even at the European level, to be fair. The problem is how that data then is compiled together. Many EU member states, for example, have some difficulty in really identifying the phenomena of human trafficking, for example, and they always try to see it in a different uh, set of crime. 
and therefore it does not get really accounted as human trafficking in aquaculture, for example. They usually consider it aid to illegal migration instead of looking at it as human trafficking. So that was a key element. Lastly, there was a question on slavery. I couldn't really understand what you meant, but probably I induced you to make that question. Uh, slavery on boats, as in forced labor, is not slavery at sea, which means transport of slaves. I hope that helps. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Vasco. And just to add my understanding that um, when we think about forced labor, it can be considered as a blood subsidy that drives IUU. So I think there are also um, arguments for expanding the formal de definition to include all types of illegality, including um, illegal labor practices. I'd like to pivot us now to a lot of comments coming in on on how we can empower women to be more involved. Um, comments noting that women can play an important role in surveillance as it relates to IUU, um, in the ability to strengthen cooperatives as Edie Trudeau spoke about, and from Corey Peet, uh, that some certifications which aim to incentivize sustainable fisheries are increasingly working to be gender sensitive and gender inclusive. So that's great to hear. So what I'd like to do is um, if uh, Faluke is still able to pose the observation about the importance of women's economic empowerment um, in their ability to contribute towards fisheries management, I'd like to hear about that and then turn it back to Edie Trude to just say a little bit more about in your experience, um, what is it that's really helpful to enabling women to empower? I loved your previous comments on social media. I hope WhatsApp is part of our solution here. So uh, can we unmute Faluke? Looks like still muted for the moment. And I wonder, Faluke, do you need to unmute yourself? Because I think on our side, we have um, tried to unmute you. If not, I will. Okay, I've unmuted myself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Please share your observation with us. It was it was wonderful. Okay. I was saying that uh, um, in addition to the reasons that Sarah gave, that economic power plays a, a major role in the involvement of women in leadership and management positions. At least in Nigeria, I know that um, we had uh, managing directors of uh, fishing companies in the industrial sector that are women, and they were able to be there because they had the financial strength, the capability, and even on the management and the administrative um, side, we've had women become senior managers, directors of fisheries in the federal and state levels because they had the professional capability to be there. So I just wanted to add that to the um, reasons that Sarah gave when she was answering our question that economic power, financial strength, capability and expertise play major role in women occupying leadership and management positions in fisheries and aquaculture. And we also have in aquaculture some women own very large farms and most of the processing facilities in Nigeria are owned by women women own those facilities and the, 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 we have two women that are licensed to export uh, smoked fish to the EU that their facilities are licensed. The only two that are licensed are women. In Nigeria, we don't have any facility owned by a man as of today that is licensed to export smoked products to the EU. But we have others who could export to um, the American market before the restriction on silly reforms came into force. But I'm trying to say that here we have other things that matter that help in determining who stays in the management position and leadership position in fisheries and aquaculture. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So let me, um, we just have about one more minute before we move to closing comments, but let me give Edie Trudith and perhaps Sarah just a quick moment to respond to this question on uh, supporting women's leadership, because it is so essential to our, our topic here today.
Yes, Heidi, uh, thank you very much. Supporting uh, women in leadership is very, very important because leadership is not power, it's not a question of power, but facilitating, you know, at the local level, for example, and that goes across all the other levels at the national level, regional, and even at the, uh, uh, at, at the global level. Uh, when women occupy positions in leadership, they have a voice and that voice cuts across and it carries messages uh, on behalf of a lot of other women. So it is really important that women are given leadership positions. And for that to happen, again, I go back to the empowering women. It's really important to support efforts that lead to empowerment of women, for them to get organized, for them to learn through these um, small, small uh, cooperatives that um, they, they form. And that's where the leadership skills also stem from. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, we do need to switch to our one minute highlight from each of the panelists. So we'll go in the same order you presented for before and please do um, looking forward to your one minute takeaway, starting with you, Sarah. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I think I just wanted to really reiterate um, that gender must be part of the conversation around how to combat IEU fishing. Otherwise, I think we risk further entrenching and um, enhancing some of those gender inequalities that exist. And so I like um, the conversation around IUU and in many ways it's, it's a very narrow def definition, but in other ways it's used as kind of a catch-all definition. And so I think when we think about ways to combat, for example, illegal fishing activities, we really need to think about who this impacts and I think we need to have very targeted um, sort of solutions or approaches to how to deal with those so that we're not necessarily displacing women who are feeding their children or sending their kids to school from those activities, um, those fishing activities. So I think just to come back to the fact that I think combating IAU fishing must be done alongside um, efforts to um, expose and highlight women in fisheries and promote gender equality. So thank you. Terrific. Very much. Thank you, Sarah. Esther? Hi. Um, I guess I would love to just reiterate the importance of this conversation and the importance of the in connect interconnectedness of what we've all brought to the table today of things happening on boats and on shore and looking not in isolation at those things, but how the domino effect of IUU affects many areas of society and family life. Um, I wanted particularly to, to highlight um, well, actually, Vasco mentioned that the primary victim might not be a woman, but the impact is uh, is felt much, much wider. And um, IUU fishing creates an increased hardship for women. Um, and I guess um, I would love to encourage uh, us today to really think about how we can increase the capacity of law enforcement uh, to sustainably and proactively address trafficking crimes to strengthen justice systems so that brokers and loan sharks and traffickers aren't able to actually prey on the most vulnerable in the first place. Um, that will require systemic change and joined up thinking uh, like the conversation we've had today. Great, thank you. Vasco. Uh, thank you. Um, I would put the focus on uh, compliances as well. Uh, we have an issue here is that both victims and traffickers are non-state actors and therefore international accountability becomes a very difficult and very thorny issue. Therefore, we have to make sure that states exercise due diligence, that they go after recruiters, brokers, uh, companies fraudulently recruiting people to go and work on board uh, these fishing vessels. And therefore, with this due diligence obligation comes a reinforced obligation to protect and Therefore, we must make states accountable for women and girls on fishing communities on their states, under their jurisdiction, as well as men at sea. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And Edie Trudeth. Thank you, Heidi. Um, my message is uh, that I want to send across is that uh, fisheries management is stronger when women are part of the decisions made. So engaging women in combating IUU and all sorts of other illegal fishing can uh, have a significant impact. And for this to happen, I go back again to sending a call to support the um, empowerment, women empowerment initiatives uh, all across um, in, at the local level, national level, and even at the regional level. 
So thank you so much. And I think that such kind of conversation uh, will happen again. And uh, women at the local level will be informed of what is happening and learn through the processes. Thank you. Terrific. Well, we've had a very um, thought provoking and engaging panel. I'm really happy to have had this time with you. I think we've come away with an understanding that women are really key actors in fisheries and that their full role hasn't been um, fully understood. But by keeping them in mind, by doing gender sensitive approaches to IUU, by empowering women to organize and to play leadership roles, and by working on the broader enabling conditions needed to allow them to engage in fisheries management and to work in equitable and safe working conditions. Um, all of this will help contribute to the global effort to counter IUU. And I just wanna close, I really love Edie Trudith's additional type of IUU. So we're combating IUU on two fronts, both illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing and ignored, invisible and unrecognized women in fisheries. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Anna, to close the session. Thank you so much, Heidi. I'm just... I would just like to say um, thank you very much to the excellent speakers uh, and to the terrific chair, and not least to all of you who have joined this webinar today or uh, followed it on the Chatham House website. And the discussion has been amazing. We've received so many questions and we really apologize for not being able to answer all of them. However, I would really encourage you to join the other sessions as well, because it is important that the gender dimension is integrated into all the panels. For instance, highly re relevant tomorrow um, for a discussion on subsidies um, and for the discussion on IU fishing in Southeast Asia and well, for any panel. So please do keep on joining these sessions. We really appreciate it. And um, thank you again for joining.